back to the little tree. Why did Saul die on that hillside? For one reason. Saul didn't obey the Lord with the Amalekites. What could that possibly have to do with me 3,000 years from that event? Well, turn with me to Colossians 3. Now, I could take you to Romans 6. I could take you to Romans 13. But I'm going to go to Colossians chapter 3 real quickly. Because we have been charged similarly by the Lord of hosts to do something in our lives. The Lord himself, a God of infinite love, meted out severe judgment on the Amalekites because those people, those people were fearful warriors and horrible, scavenging people who were the embodiment of Esau. You say, what does that have to do with Colossians 3? Well, Esau, remember, the firstborn son of Isaac, was heir in line for the blessings of God. And the scriptures tell us Esau despised his birthright. Remember that from Sunday school when you were little and you used to go through those stories? Esau despised the birthright. You know, I always thought that meant he didn't want the cow or the camels and the goats and he didn't want the sheep. He wanted to be a hunter. That's not what the blessing was. It wasn't the material inheritance. Jacob got that second. It was the birthright. You know what the birthright was? Surely I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and it would have been the God of Esau. But Esau despised God. In fact, Hebrews 12 tells us that Esau was a closet fornicator. He was secretly living in sin. He was a profane man. That means he secretly hated God, but publicly went along with the thing. He was a profane, immoral, fornicatious, proud man. And he turned from God, and God took the blessing and put it on his devious... Uh, you know, deceitful, uh, you know, brother Jacob, the deceiver and the usurper. But that's because Jacob was willing to s- repent of his sin and Esau wasn't. So you say, what does all that have to do with Colossians 3? Well, look at this. You and I have within us the flesh. The flesh is the traitorous, real us that we were born with. It despises our birthright that we've gotten from God. It despises the blessing of God and the presence of God. And our flesh will do anything. If you want to know if you have the flesh, just sit down and read the Bible. Everything comes to your mind other than God. You try and listen to a message, everything comes to your mind. You try and pray, everything comes to your mind. And every desire starts hitting you and you start just wanting everything. That's your flesh. And you and I were born with that flesh. And nothing really really was was going wrong until we got saved. And then it really ruined the flesh's day because now we wanted God. And our flesh is not removed at our salvation. In fact, that's why it says in Colossians 3, Therefore, verse 5, put to death your members which are on the earth. You see, this is what we're living with. We are living with our flesh. And our flesh is seeking to make our members, our eyes, to make our desires, our appetites, our habits, our mind, to make our body its servant. And our flesh wants our body to serve it and to gratify its desires. And so what we're supposed to do is utterly destroy our flesh. Now, I don't mean the monastic, ascetic lifestyle. I don't mean wearing a, you know, a belt with, with nails pointing in. I don't mean uh, uh, doing all the, the wacko things that, that, that so-called believers have done through the ages to, to hurt their flesh, you know, like they get crucified these people in the Philippines every year, others crawl on broken glass. They do crazy stuff in the name of Christ. It's not talking about physically harming our body. What it's talking about is putting to death these manifestations of the flesh. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves also walked when you lived in them. But now you are to put off all these. You see what he's saying is this this Amalek, this flesh principle, God is at war with Amalek. It has gone from being a nomadic tribe. They, they erased them and were erased from history. Now it's become a spiritual conflict of the flesh against the spirit. And Saul becomes a very graphic picture for us. Saul had the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came on him. Saul conquered in the power of the Spirit of God, and he was led forth and did mighty campaigns, but Saul refused 
to yield to the Spirit of God and utterly destroy Amalek. And he didn't destroy. He kept the best of what God hated. And that nemesis Amalek turned around and destroyed Saul in the end. Now, the blessing is that for us, this is not a a picture in in. Colossians 3, of salvation or not salvation, he's saying in verse 1, you're already raised with Christ, you already are seeking those things above, you've already set your mind, you're already born again, but you and I have been commissioned like Saul that we are to have constant warfare with our flesh. And let me tell you a little secret, which is something to really think about and pray about. Any, I can see Saul's men. They're sorting out. Everything of Amalek was utterly to be considered to be defiled and toxic and deadly and and off limits. And they went through the trash heap in God's sight of what he hated and picked out the best stuff of what he hated and said, I know God hates everything, but I'm just going to keep a little of it and I'm I'm going to keep that part and destroy all the rest. And, And we would look at that and say, how foolish. God said, utterly destroy every part of the Amalekites. How foolish for you to keep part of it. Look back at Colossians 3 and think about what we do in our lives. God says, I want you to have nothing to do with anything that that grieves or quenches my spirit. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On down to verse 8, anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language, lying in verse 9. He said, I don't want you to have anything to do with that. And you know what we do? We say, God, destroy it all, but we keep the best little things that kind of like we, we need and we like, and we keep those secret, those are what are called secret sins. And you know what? Because we're Christians, we can pretty much keep those things down, and we keep them suppressed, and we feel real bad when we're involved in any of those bad things, but basically we have a pretty good life. But what happens when we get weak? Now think about Saul. Any part of your and my old life that we do not mortify and ask God to destroy in our lives and ask God to utterly throttle and starve and deny and see powerless, rendered powerless in our life, any part of that will come back when we're not looking, when we're the weakness, and will attack and slay us. You know, I remember very clearly on the phone with my dear friend, Lehman Strauss. He was dying. He was in a hospital in Florida. He'd had a heart attack. He was on his deathbed, actually. And I said, Lehman, how can I help you? And he said, one way. This is a man that was in his 80s, had taught the Bible his whole life, written a whole shelf of books I have. He said, I want to finish well to the end. You know what I hear? I hear 1 Corinthians 9, 24, and I'll read that to you as a verse to have on your mind at this communion. The Apostle Paul said this, Don't you know that those who run the race all run, but one will receive the prize? Run in such a way you might obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do this to obtain a perishable crown, but we have an imperishable. Therefore I run, not as with uncertainty I fight, not as one who beats the air. I discipline my body. I mortify my flesh, is what he's saying, and bring it in subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I should become disqualified. And then back up to chapter 3, last verse, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Everyone's work, 1 Corinthians 3, 13, will be clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. How could that happen? That hillside, that windswept hillside 3,000 years ago reminds us that God's man chose to incompletely obey God. And the one thing he was commissioned to do, utterly destroy Amalek, he didn't do. And an Amalek, an Amalekite, came back in his weakest moment and slew him and took his crown. In your and my weakest moment, any flesh that we have secretly cultivated 
nurtured, protected, hid, and allowed to remain in our lives without exposing it to the work of the Spirit of God to mortify and to sanctify us and to keep from dominating in our life, anything that we do not mortify will someday come back and attack us at our weakest moment. Do you wonder why godly people do crazy things in their lives sometimes? Why they they walk away from a lifetime of faithfulness? Why they walk away from a lifetime of, of family and ministry? Do you know why? Because they secretly... Don't hack Agag to pieces in their life. They keep a little bit of the flesh nurtured, providing some type of of need being met in their life that Jesus Christ wants to meet. Now, does that mean that we can never have sin in our life, that we can come to the point where we're eradicated? No. No, you can never get rid of the flesh, but we must never allow any of the flesh to be protected from the relentless assault of the Spirit of God and communion. It's when we come with our flesh, dominated by our spirit, before the living and eternal God and say, Spirit of the living God, search me and see if there's any wicked way in me. And if there's any wicked way in me, any hidden sin, any unconfessed, unforsaken, any nurtured lust of the flesh that I am hiding, that, that, that I am sparing, that you hate, that I'm sparing, Lord, I don't want that anymore. I don't want that flesh to rise up in my weakest moment and rob me of my crown that I want to give to Jesus someday. That's what communion's all about. So I'd invite you to do this tonight. I would invite you to say, Lord, search my heart. Point your finger of your spirit in any part of my life that I am secretly nurturing and I am secretly allowing to grow in my life some covetousness, desire for things, pride, thinking I'm great in something, or lust of the flesh, some secret sin of the flesh that I am nurturing. And Lord, I want you to mortify that. I let go. I'm not going to protect it. I expose all of my life to your Spirit's power, and I ask you to mortify that in my life. Now, does that mean it'll be gone forever? No, it'll crop up somewhere else. But that's why we are relentlessly at war against Amalek all of our generation. But communion is where we stop everything, throw open our heart to the Lord, say, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me your way.